Yeti is a brand that's no stranger to hype, but this new 160E has stirred the comment sections like nothing else before it. This thing has got a six bar linkage, six finity tuned anti-squat curve, an inflection point and a price tag of nearly £12,000. But is it any good? Let's go and find out. Now apparently it's taken five years to develop this bike. And while I can't argue with that, my hunch is Yeti could have brought it to market much sooner if it wanted to. I think Yeti wanted to let some of the other boutique US brands enter the lion's den first and take the flak from a fairly hostile North American market rather than having to do it itself. So let's talk about this Sixfinity suspension. It's a complex linkage for sure, but it basically aims to do a similar job to Yeti's Switch Infinity design found on analog bikes like the SB150. Now, during the early part of the travel, the lower link rotates upwards until about halfway when the Sixfinity strut starts pushing it down again. Now this has the effect of changing the virtual pivot point and the direction of migration of the virtual pivot point, which affects the anti-squat characteristics. So this means Yeti can keep the anti-squat consistently high through the sag zone for pedal efficiency. And then once past the inflection point, it can fall away to give good bump compliance, support and less pedal feedback. Now what else do I need to tell you about this new Yeti? Well, it comes standard with a bog standard Shimano EP8 motor, 630 watt hour battery. Now you get a full carbon frame and on this top T1 model, there's an XT drivetrain, factory level Fox suspension and SRAM code RSC brakes with a whopping 220 millimeter rotor up front. Now both the 38 fork and the X2 shock come with four way adjustable damping as well as air pressure and volume. So I'm really pleased to say that Yeti has done a great job with its online suspension calculator. The recommended pressures gave me perfect 19 and a half millimeters of sag. Bearing in mind this has got a 60 millimeter stroke shock. So that's just under 30%. And the damping settings were really close as well, which meant I could just jump straight on this and get shredding. A whole lot less time baffing around getting it set up. Most bikes now come with flip chips, usually to adjust the geometry. But Yeti has gone a bit left field on the 160E with progression settings. So by changing the lower link, you can adjust the progression between 25 30 and 35 percent. Now it comes standard with the 30 percent setting and that's what I've been running today and so far I found it works really well with a great compromise between support and bump compliance and I've only managed to bottom it out on some of the flattest landings. Now Yeti says the 160E is a dedicated race bike, which to me infers something uncompromising and edgy. But in fact, I found it really friendly and easy to get along with. And it actually feels a lot like the superb SP150, which is hardly surprising when you see that the geometry is almost identical. 
In fact, the only differences are that the chain stays are 10 millimeters longer on the E16 to the 160E. That's because the motor sticks out the back and the bottom bracket is three millimeters higher. But actually, the 160E sags so much under its own weight that the static measurements are basically the same. And Yeti has also stuck with a 29 inch rear wheel rather than turning it into a mullet. Now the reach on this size large is 480 millimeters, which is pretty large for an e-bike. So I've swapped the stock 50 millimeter stem for a 40 to help bring my weight back and make the front end a bit easier to lift. Right, as you can see, this is not the easiest bike to manual. There we go. Now, as I've said, the 160E is not the most playful or agile of bikes and it's not that easy to manual or bunny hop. Now that could be down to the chunky 23 and a half kilogram weight. But it also could be to do with the anti-squat falling away deeper into the travel when you load it up to get that pop. Now, it's definitely not as adept at rapid direction changes as something like the YT decoy or specialized turbo lever. But it rails constant radius turns with absolutely bucket loads of confidence. The head angle might not be the slackest around at 64 degrees but there's no shortage of front end stability when trucking along. And the bike feels great on tracks with a mellow gradient and medium gruff, roughness like this. Now I love it on constant radius turns like this. You just lock it into the programmed arc and it just tracks perfectly. Now, despite the relatively high anti-squat numbers, the 160E is pretty good on rough climbs. The shock is actually quite free to move over bumps, so there's quite a bit of traction. But when I really stomp on the pedals, everything tenses up and just drives me forward. But at the same time, I've got to question the need for so much complication when you've already got an extra five or six hundred watts of power under your belt. Am I really looking for the ultimate pedal efficiency? I'm not so sure. So I think it's about time we talked about my complaints. And when you're spending £12,000, you can afford to be picky. Now, firstly, we know a lot about the Shimano EP8 motor we know that it rattles. Now, this bike doesn't seem as bad as some that I've ridden, but it is there. You do notice it on a quiet descent when you're not going too fast. There's not too much wind rush going past your ears. It's just a bit of an annoying noise on an otherwise quiet bike. Equally, the stock Shimano charging port feels a bit cheap and flimsy, and the battery release mechanism tends to get a bit stiff. And arguably, it's not the most punchy motor it's not the fastest and most responsive motor and i'd also say that the range doesn't seem to be as good as a bosch with a similar size battery now what else well i think that yeti could probably take about 10 or 20 millimeters off the seat tube length just to give riders who want to size up a bit more leeway to fit in longer droppers shorter droppers whatever they want to do now there's lots of dropper insertion depth in this frame but at 460, it's quite tall compared to a lot of contemporary bikes. Now, I also experienced clipping my heels a little bit on the chainstay down here. And actually, 
before I got this bike, obviously someone has clipped it quite a lot because the paint has worn out. Now I've been clipped in, I don't have the biggest feet. So someone with bigger feet, maybe a duck foot stance, flat pedals, whatever, might actually encounter more of an issue with this. Now, another thing, the lower link is protected by a mud guard down there, but it's still pretty open to the elements and there's a lot of mud and dirt build up around the lower pivot on this bike here. So the Yeti 160E is undoubtedly a good bike on the climbs and boasts a turn of speed that gets you out of corners rapidly and carries you smoothly over chunder. But does it give any noticeable advantage over benchmark e-bikes such as the YT Decoy, Trek Slash and Specialized Turbo Levo? Well, not really. And therein lies the rub. As much as the 160E is a really good e-bike, it doesn't move the game on beyond any of those cheaper alternatives. You're paying a huge premium for that head badge, which, if history has taught us anything, probably means that everyone will want one.